tell you about this. <laughs> it's very important. Chebi is a black writer from Nigeria. I'm a black writer from this country. But Chebi and myself, in of all places, Florida, there we were, mm -hmm. together. And it defeated a conspiracy which meant we should never be able to speak from all that water, that distance. That many years. And there we were. In April of 1980, at the University of Florida, Chenua Achebe and James Baldwin met for the first and only time. The occasion was the African Literature Association Conference. With the support of the Center for African Studies, the event was organized by UF professor of French, African, and Caribbean literature, Dr. Bernadette Caillé and Dr. Mildred Hill Lubin, professor of English, African, and African American Studies, and the first African American Associate Dean of UF's Graduate School. The conference was to address the African aesthetic. There were writers delegations from across the continent and scholars from across the country and the world. An African festival was held in Gainesville with music from Cameroonian artist Francis Bebe. The event would go down in history as the singular occasion when Nigerian literary giant Chenua Achebe and African-American author and civil rights activist James Baldwin encountered one another face to face. A friendship ensued, but they never met again. They were both to teach at the University of Massachusetts in 1987, the year Achebe's last novel, Ant Hills of the Savannah, was published. But Baldwin fell ill and died a few months later. It is said he had a copy of Achebe in his briefcase. Achebe and Baldwin remain leading figures of 20th century literature. Each of them addressed art and politics in radically new ways to new audiences in the context of the world historical shifts of decolonization in Africa and the fight for racial justice in the U.S. Ernest A. Champion, who moderated the 1980 event, argues that Baldwin's and Achebe's writings demonstrate a remarkable similarity of thought in the struggle against colonialism in Africa and slavery and racism in America. Forty years later, we invite you to join us to commemorate and interrogate Achebe and Baldwin's historic meeting. What did it mean then for literary and artistic expression, for the recognition of the black experience at home and globally, for understanding the relationship between art and politics? What does it mean now that it happened here on the UF campus where African and African-American Afro-Latin studies thrive, yet where students and faculty of color remain a small minority and our city and country is still beset by anti-black violence and inequity. Our program today invites return through memoir, scholarly commentary, and historical reflection. Tomorrow, we invite you back to partake in reading, writing, and performing the lived nexus of Africa and America in the present on the UF campus and beyond. A brief background. Chinua Achebe was born on November 16, 1913, Ogidi, Nigeria. He studied English and Literature at the University College of Ibadan. Upon graduation, he rose through the ranks at the Nigerian Broadcasting Corporation and soon launched a publishing company. He completed his debut novel, Things Fall Apart, while in London working for the BBC. Released in 1958, Heinemann, the publisher, was unsure if it would sell overseas. Now recognized as a landmark piece of post-colonial fiction, it remains the most widely read African literary work of our time. Achebe wrote that his first priority was to inform the world that African peoples did not hear of culture for the first time from Europeans, that their societies were not mindless, that they had poetry, and above all, they had dignity. For Achebe, art and political concerns were not mutually exclusive. Written on the cops of Nigerian independence, Things Fall Apart addresses deep-seated cultural values as well as discord and the disruption wrought by missionization and colonial rule. 
Achebe soon followed up with a flurry of novels, No Longer at Ease in 1960, Arrow of God published in 1964, Man of the People published in 1966, all addressing education, modernization, and corruption head on. Achebe was also a poet, essayist, and political activist. His early career was interrupted by the Nigerian Civil War from 1967 to 1970. Achebe, an Igbo man from eastern Nigeria, described Biafra in a 1968 interview in Transition magazine as a tribal conflict accentuated by the power struggle in the political scene. Ensnowed in the violence, a target of bombings and forced to flee from his home in Lagos, Achebe used his growing literary stature to draw international attention to the conflict. His final book, There Was a Country, published in 2008, is a personal history of Biafra. Achebe traveled to the U.S. several times in the 1960s on fellowships and writing tours and accepted a position at UMass Amherst in 1972. He had a long career on the faculty at Bard College. Achebe continued to move back and forth between the U.S. and Nigeria, writing, teaching, weighing and weighing in on political matters in Nigeria. He also promoted the literary careers of the next generation of African writers. A few years older than Achebe, James Ball was born on August 2, 1924 in Harlem, New York. After leaving his biological father, his mother married a Baptist preacher, David Baldwin, in 1927, a harsh upbringing recounted in, in the first novel, Go Tell It on the Mountain, published in 1953. Growing up in Harlem, Baldwin was harassed and abused by the New York City police. He later wrote, I knew I was black, of course, but I also knew I was smart, he said. I didn't know how I would use my mind, or even if could, but that was the only thing I had to use. At age 21, turning from his first vocation as a preacher, he began to publish essays and short stories. He left the United States at the age of 24 to settle in Paris. Here he wrote another coming-of-age novel, Giovanni's Room, 1956, which broke new ground for its depiction of gay life. In addition to meeting French intellectuals de Beauvoir, Camus, and Sartre, in Paris, Baldwin met leading pan-African scholars and literary figures, including Czech Ante Diop and Leopold Senghor, an experience he writes about in Nobody Knows My Name. Connecting him to Africa in another way, in Paris, Baldwin also learned firsthand about the Algerian fight for independence from friends caught in the struggle. Yet, he never made it to the continent. Baldwin returned to, to the U.S. as the civil rights movement gained momentum. He joined CORE, Congress of Racial Equality, and SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and made his first visit to the South in 1957. Deeply involved in the struggle, he came to know Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X and published The Fire Next Time, taking on historic and systemic racism in the U.S. He was part of the 1963 March on Washington and walked from Selma to Montgomery in 1965. By 1970, Baldwin was back in France. When Baldwin and Achebe finally met in 1980 in Florida, Achebe would write, My joy no doubt triggered the rather untypical flamboyance with which I greeted him. Mr. Baldwin, I presume, you should have seen that severe countenance of his crumble instantly into boyish happiness. The tone was joyful and also serious. With typical hyperbole, Baldwin called me a brother he had not seen in 400 years. Yes, well, I'll tell you what, um, uh, another story. There was a, <clears throat> a conference uh, at which uh, James Baldwin and I uh, were to speak. Uh, an African literature conference somewhere in, 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 the, in the South. And uh, what 
Baldwin said in uh, introducing me uh, or talking about me to the audience was, um, this is a brother I have not seen in 400 years. The conference plenary session featured Achebe and Baldwin in animated conversation, discussing literary aesthetics, the role of art in political life, the writer's craft, and what they knew of one another's works. The homecoming was not so simple, however. Baldwin and Achebe's dialogue was met by racist invective, illustrating exactly what the two writers had dedicated their intellectual lives to challenging someone, to this day, no one knows whom, took over the intercom of the Holiday Inn while Baldwin was at the podium. You're gonna to have to cut that out, Mr. Baldwin. We can't stand for this kind going, going on, the voice said, interrupting Baldwin a second time and a third time. Speakers and audience were stunned. This was 1980, after all. It was the U.S. South, and anything was possible. Achebe writes in a 2007 piece, The Day I Finally Met Baldwin. Halfway into our conversation, a mystery voice on public address system began to insult Mr. Baldwin. The geniality vanished. Stalwarts in the audience rushed out to guard the exits. For a fraction of a second, Baldwin seemed nervous. Baldwin quickly recovered his composure, stood erect and defiant, and replied to the intruder, but Mr. Baldwin will have his say. White supremacy has had its day. And there we were. I'm convinced that is what drove whoever interrupted us on the loudspeaker mad. The loudspeaker started crackling, you know, you don't know what you're doing, you, know, you don't know what's happening. Above your head, you know, something's gone mm -hmm. wrong with the mic or the acoustics or whatever. You were speaking? I was speaking. I was on stage at that moment. It was an interruption. I don't quite know what that interference is. And I, <laughs> I suppose the best thing to do is to ignore. And the voice said, Mr. Baldwin, we can't have no talk like that. And everyone was stunned. And I just repeated what I'd said, you know. Mr. Baldwin is nevertheless going to finish his opening statement. And I will tell you, now, whoever you are, and if you assassinate me in the next two minutes, I am telling you this. It no longer matters what you think. The doctrine of white supremacy on which the Western world is based has had its hour, has had its day. It's over. Over the next two days, we ask what this encounter of Africa and America, U.S. South and Global South, hate and genius, art and violence, portends for the literary imagination. How might we come to know and narrate, narrate this past in its midst, in Florida, at UF, where these words and memories are lodged, and from afar, distant in time, and from diverse spaces of identity and experience? How, from our varied vantage points, has the racial landscape connecting Africa and America changed and remained the same? Where do we individually and collectively stand in this process? We ask, does a black aesthetic today displace the pursuit of an African one? Can there ever be a single voice to speak with or against? Does a literary imagination forged in displacement and diaspora transcend attempts at localization? And finally, how can reading, telling, returning to and writing new stories advance our shared humanity. These questions and more inform the discussions, performances, and student and writers forums that follow. Our first panel this morning is a roundtable 
featuring five scholars in attendance at the 1980 ALA meeting.